John 17, 1 through 5, and 21 to 26. Okay, John 17, 1 through 5. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to, keep, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I, that I had with you before the world existed. Verse 21, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in you, may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved me them, loved them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me, where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Amen. Thank you, Luna, for again, for reading the passage for us. And um, before we get into the actual passage, I'm going to be doing a little bit of teaching today, if that's okay. So if you want to take notes, please feel free to do that. There is a prayer that uh, I pray almost at the beginning of every year. It's also a prayer I pray <laughs> at the beginning of every birthday. And I don't know if you have prayed this before, but it goes something like this. Lord, I pray that I would be more intimate with you this year than last year. I pray that I would love you more this year than last year. I don't know if you've prayed something along those lines, but that's kind of automatically what, what comes to mind for me. I prayed that again at the beginning of this year. God, I want to love you. I want to be more intimate with you. I want to know your heart more this year than last year. By now, at the age of 34, unashamed of that, you know, I should have loved God, you know, accumulation of every year, right? You know, you know how it works, but more often than not, if you're like me, at the end of the year, when I reflect on my year, I feel a bit discouraged. I'm like, man, did I really get to know God's heart more? Was I really intimate with God more this year than last year? But I still pray it. I still pray it. My birthday's in June, so when I pray it again, you know, it's kind of like half, you know, half time prayer or whatever. But um, how do you guys experience intimacy with God? What does it look like for you? Maybe you're the type who likes to just walk and talk with God. Or more like walk and think with God, right? Let's be real, right? Um, maybe you try to spend alone time with the Lord where, you know, you set apart the time. You get the right background music, you know? Um, you know, you get your favorite hand drip coffee. For, the, for me, it's Ethiopia G2. And you got your, your, your Bible open. You, you got your moleskin open and... Real quick, you take a pause, you know, post it on Instagram real quick. And then, like, you try, you try to close your eyes to, you know, put out all the distractions. And you get into the Word, and you're reading, and you do all that. How many of you guys have experienced that? But you set everything up, you check off, you check off all the right boxes, but in the end, you still feel disconnected. It's like, man, I'm doing all the right things. But like, uh, e even at best, I learned something. 
I read the Bible. Oh, I, I, I learned that. Maybe even retained it or memorized it. But, you know, your response to it. When you, when you pray after, it, it, it just doesn't seem to flow out. And you do this for a while, and you realize the more and more you do it, my, atten- my attention span, I'm on the struggle bus regarding that, and I get so easily distracted. You do this for a while, because you're like, I'm going to push through, I'm going to keep doing this, and you realize, man, I've been doing this for months now, and you just feel like you're on maybe autopilot. I should be doing this. But after some time, it's like, man, why do I feel so disconnected still? Like, isn't this how you're supposed to do intimacy with God? And I share this with you because these are my external processings of my heart at times. Many times, actually. You know, especially in this uh, COVID era, age, the past couple years, you know, like, there are pros and cons to, you know, our spiritual walks, our spiritual formation. The, if you want to look at optimistically, we hear things, and we, I've said this too, we share this too, where it's like, Lord, you know, we believe that COVID is a time where God is perhaps setting apart for you so that you don't have to use church programs as a crutch so that you can establish your intimacy with God. This is an opportunity for you. That's the optimistic view of it. Right? And ideally, brothers and sisters, ideally, I want that to be true in my life. Yeah, you're right. It is an opportune time. I am at home. I do have more time. I do have less excuses. You know what I mean? But if I'm going to be honest with you, that's an ideal, but it's been hard. It's been hard. You want to feel connected. But because of COVID, it's not really helping. Right. Uh, on the last day of 2021, we had a service here. Some of you guys tuned in online. Some of you guys came. We had a worship service, and we had a time of reflecting on 2021. Many of you guys did that. And I was leading that time of reflection, and, and I asked everyone to close their eyes and just ask the Lord, Lord, would you give me a word? Would you give me a verse or something that I can focus on for 2022? And some of you guys got some words or phrases or verses. Pastor Susie got, she shared, she got the word joy for herself that she wants to focus on this year. For me, I'd like to share with you, for the word for 2022 that I am wanting to hone in on and the, the word that I heard, it was a very interesting word. It was, I heard, the, I heard the word communion. I heard the word communion. And I was like, that's interesting. Communion. And, and I closed my eyes, and I was praying into that, Lord, what do you mean communion? And I saw just an image or a picture of just a huge banquet. And many of us were just sitting around it, and we were laughing like crazy. We were having a good time. On one side of the table, there were tears. On one side of the table, there was a lot of laughter. And we were just feasting. And it, it was such an ideal and beautiful picture I got. And, and, and I heard that word communion. And I started praying, yes, God. I pray that this year, I would have deeper communion with you and deeper communion with my family here at New Philly. That's what I begin to pray. And then I asked the follow-up question, Uh, not follow-up, another question to reflect on the year. I asked the question, hey, how have I experienced God the clearest this past year? How have you experienced God the clearest? Like, oh, God was moving, like, like, I experienced God the clearest this past year. And all the examples I wrote down and some some of the answers that I heard is very interesting the clearest that people have experienced God, including myself, was always in the context of community. It was with people. For a lot of people, the highlight of the year where they experienced God was at the retreat when we sought God together. For some people, it was a sacred moment where they got prayed for or prayed with people. You know, there was 
there were key moments, even on my list, there was times when there was this very important time, and I don't have time to go into detail. I had, you know, dinner with Pauline and I, we had dinner with Jacob and Amy one night, and then it was such a significant moment. We got to pray for each other, and it was such a sweet time, and I felt God's presence so strong in the context of communion. And it got me thinking, maybe that's it. Maybe that's where I can know God more, with his people. Maybe I feel frustrated and not experiencing breakthrough in my intimacy with God because I'm not necessarily pursuing it with people. Maybe that's where intimacy is found. Maybe that's the spark that we need at least. So brothers and sisters, if you desire to know God more and be more intimate with him this year, perhaps this message will interest you. The title of today's message is called Divine Communion. Divine Communion. All right. You know, when we feel like we're on autopilot, when we feel like so disconnected with God, even when we're doing the spiritual disciplines. Perhaps I encourage us, one of the best things to do is actually take a step back, all right, and recalibrate our hearts and think about our whys. Think about our attitudes and, and our perspective toward intimacy. Am I, am I, do I want to be intimate with God because I should? Do, do I want to be intimate with God because I... I I really genuinely want to know him. Like, like, why? Why do I want to be intimate with God? And to assist us, to help us. What helps me is actually going back to understanding God's grand narrative. God's grand narrative. So here's where I'd like us to start. Let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back to the beginning. For those of us who are doing one-year Bible reading plan, where do we start? We start in Genesis, all right? Don't worry, I'm going to get to John 17. Don't worry, all right? <laughs> why, why make Luna read that, all right? Genesis 1.1, for those of us who know the Bible, it starts with this. In the beginning, God. Let me just start right there. In the beginning, God. Before I get into in the beginning, God created let me just start real quick. In the beginning, God, meaning before anything existed, before anything was created, there was God, the uncreated God. I'd like to teach you a fancy word that I learned in seminary that actually really helps me understand God. And this word is called God's aseity. Everyone say aseity. I learned this in, in, in my seminary class, and then every time our professor opens up the class in prayer, he always says, Lord, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are an ase God. He always says, ase God. Ase, Latin. A means from, se means from oneself. From oneself. The aseity of God means this, that God is sufficient to himself. He is independent of anything outside himself. God is uncreated. God is eternal. God just is. And that means, that gives us understanding when God says, I am who I am. God, who are you? I am. Nobody else can say that but God. Aseity of God. The uncreated one. As a Christian... We believe that God is the triune God, three in one. God the Father, God the Spirit, and God the Son. And God is the unity of three. In our statement of faith, I'm going to put it up here on the slide, we have this statement of the triune God. I'd like us to read it together out loud. Right? One, two, three. We believe in one living and true God, eternally existing in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The uncreated God has existed in relationship with himself for all eternity, and each person of the Trinity serves different functions while being perfectly coexistent, 
co-equal, and co-eternal. Amen. This is God, our God whom we worshiped together this morning, our triune God. And when we think about who God is, the aseity of God, the triune God, here's what comes to mind. It's fascinating. Before man was made, before anything was made, unity existed. Before anything was created, guess what? Relationship existed. Before anything was made, guess what existed? Intimacy was present. It's not that God made man and then intimacy started. No, intimacy always was there. It's who God is. Intimacy. Doesn't that put a new meaning, a far deeper meaning on that truth? We have heard all the time, Solomon and Luna, you guys are love this. God is love. God is love is the name of their branding company, right? God is love. He didn't become love after he made something to love. God has always been love because God has always been relationship and intimacy. That's mind-blowing. That's wow. This has always existed, love and intimacy. And then what happens? God is there. He creates. Let's fast forward to day six. Day six, it says this. God said, mind-blowing. God says, let who? Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God says, hey, this is who I am before creation. And then he made man. And he said, hey, let's make man in our image and likeness. Brothers and sisters, why do you and I have longings for connection why do you and i have longings for relationship and intimacy and communion why do you and i even feel frustration and discouragement because of a lack of the intimacy and communion why do we feel things like loneliness why because of the verse i just read because God said, let us make men in our image. Yes, you and I are made in God's image. And God is relationship. God is intimacy. And God is communion. That's why we feel these things. That's why, brothers and sisters, you and I, we are made for communion. We're made for communion. There's another word. Um, there's another word I'd like to teach you that I learned in seminary. This word is called protology. Can you say protology? And protology, anything that ends in ology means the study of, right? So theology means the study of God, right? Eschatology, the study of the end times. What is protology? Anyone knows what proto means? What is prototype? It's the original design. Protology is the study of God's original design. And you can find that pre-sin, Genesis 1 through 3. Genesis 1 through 3 is so packed with God's heart of his purposes of why he created and who he is. The study of original design. Protology says this that God made mankind to reflect who God is. I'll say that again. God made mankind, God made the Garden of Eden. And by the way, do you know what Eden means? Eden means delight. Eden means delight. He made the Garden of Eden and created creation. And it says that God walked in the cool of the day with man to commune 
and have relationship with him. This was God's original design. Let me manifest myself and who I am in my creation. Then what happened? Chapter three happened. Oh man, chapter three happened. Sin came. Sin came into the picture, and what did sin do? Sin broke fellowship. God had a plan for intimacy, perfect fellowship, Edenic fellowship, and then sin came into the picture, started tempting man and said this, there's more for you. And then what kind of tree did they eat from? They ate from, it's very interesting, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's so interesting that the Bible calls that tree the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because what does this mean? Let me just quickly explain what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is. It is this. It is a knowledge that quote-unquote surpasses God's knowledge, meaning I don't need God anymore. It's the tree that symbolizes independence from God. In other words, the tree of division from God. They eat from this tree. Sin brought disunity. Sin brought independence from God. And then sin bled into all of our relationships. It tainted what we were made for. And then sin brings division. Now we deal with, every day now, we deal with in a world and we deal with the effects of this sin. We have division. We have divorce. We have hatred. We have jealousy. We have war, we have comparison, we have insecurities, we have brokenness, we have classism, we have racism. We have all these effects of sin because we thought we knew more than God. We ate from the knowledge, tree of from the knowledge of good and evil. Now this message sounds very womp womp, doesn't it? But how about this? Let me get to the gospel. Let me get to the good news. Here's the good news. God, his, you know what he's doing? He's restoring his original order. God wants to, his, the passion of his heart is to restore the communion that he so desires. So what does he do? The father sends his one and only son he sends his one and only, Jesus becomes incarnate, becomes man. He takes on the sin of man, nails it to the cross, and he dies on our behalf. And Christ is sent on a mission. What is Christ's mission? Is to rest, ultimately, is to restore communion and intimacy and have us experience this divine communion with God. Jesus comes. I love this narrative. I love talking about this narrative. Jesus comes, and he lives amongst men. And three years before he dies upon the cross, guess what happens? He's ready to preach. The time has come. He's ready to do miracles. He's ready to bring in the kingdom of God. And right before he does any ministry, what happens? The Trinity has a real huddle real quick. They have a huddle. Matthew 3, 16, says, after being baptized, Jesus the Son came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens opened, and he saw the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, descending as a dove and lighting upon him. And behold, a voice, the Father's voice, from heaven said, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. I see a divine reunion of some sorts, a divine huddle Jesus is empowered by the Holy Spirit. The Father says, I'm proud of you, my son. And then break. <laughs> Jesus goes, boom, healing, miracles. Preaches the kingdom of God. And then the, we see the Godhead at work to bring salvation and to restore original design. Boom, let's do this. Boom, let's do it. And Jesus, he goes, read the scriptures. It's so exciting. 
Brothers and sisters, if there's, I only have one main point today. And the main point is this. You and I, we are made, we are made for divine communion. We have these feelings and desires because we're made in his image. We are made for divine communion. And we have to, we have to grasp the weight of God's desire for this. This is where it starts. We have to understand, we have to pause and reset. If you're going on autopilot, we have to reset and grasp the truth, grasp and understand God's heart that he longs for you and I to experience this divine communion. He wants it more than we do. How badly does he want it? How badly does he want it? We look to Calvary. That's how bad he wants it. That's how bad he wants it. And we get to this passage. It says right there, right before Jesus is about to go to the cross, right before he comes to do what he came to do, he prays. He speaks to who? Jesus speaks to the Father. He's always spoken to the Father. From the beginning of his incarnate life to the end, he's always spoken to the Father. He's always said things like, my food, what sustains me is to do the will of the Father. Right? He, he says things, and he, it says right here, he lifted up his eyes to heaven. I want you to try to understand what Jesus is feeling here. He lifted up his eyes to heaven. He's looking home. And you know what he's thinking? He's thinking, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. And he says, Father, Abba, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. The hour has come. We can't just read that like it's nothing. Jesus is saying, Father, the moment that we've been waiting for, it's finally here. It's time for me to die and resurrect. It's time for me to finally make a way to restore communion and intimacy. And with the context of what I just shared today in God's narrative, let me just read verse 20. Sorry about that. Uh, Luna was supposed to read verse 20 too, but kind of got mixed up. It's okay. <laughs> let me just read verse 20 and understand the heart of Christ here. He says, he prays this, Father, I do not ask for these only, but also I ask for those who will believe in me through the word, that they may all be, what? One. Just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also, they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Brothers and sisters, here Jesus, he's praying for future believers. He's praying for you and I. What does he pray? He's praying that you and I would be one. In other words, he's praying, he's longing for us to manifest who he is. The same communion and intimacy that existed before creation, Jesus is praying, I pray that for the future believers. Jesus' heart is that we would experience divine communion. He's praying that we would reflect who he is. Christian unity is a reflection of the image of God. It's a reflection of who he is. When we choose to love one another, brothers and sisters, when we choose to serve one another, when we choose to pursue relationship within this diverse community, when we choose to do this, what are we doing? We are reflecting the image of God. And when we reflect him, guess what? We experience him. We experience intimacy. That's what I realized in this 
end of 2021 reflection. I experience intimacy with God when I experience divine communion with his people because we are made in his image. Does that make sense, guys? This is kind of mind-blowing, but it's like, oh, like, I want it. There's something in me. I was made for something divine like that. I was made for the divine. If we don't pursue this, if we don't understand this foundational theology, what will motivate us to pursue relationships from people so different from us? You know? Where will the practice of selflessness, self-giving, generosity, and service be if we don't pursue this? Our desire, your desire, my desire to be one with God and experience intimacy with God, it must translate into our desire to be one with one another in Him. All right? I want to read this quote by Catherine Lacuna. It's a very, it's a quote that's like, oh, it makes me feel uncomfortable, but I know it's true. It says, if we cannot enter into a life of love and communion with others, then we cannot enter into divine life. Think about that. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying, you know, we need a healthy independency. You know what I mean? Like, that's, that's another sermon. I'm not saying that you, we need our individual intimacies with God. That's not what I'm saying, all right? There's a limit to the experience of intimacy with God when we try to live our Christian lives so independently and isolated from the body of Christ because it's not a reflection of who God is. It's not who he is. Verse 25 says, Father, I desire, oh, Jesus, Father, I desire, I long for that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you have loved me before the foundation of the world, before the foundation of the world. Jesus, again, he's saying, I want them to experience what I experienced before the foundation of the world, before creation. This prayer is charged with longing here. This is bitter, it's like bittersweet, Jesus. It's like, time has come, Father, I'm about to go home, be reunited with you. It's like so sweet, but also bitter because he's just experienced that communion with his disciples. And he's praying that the disciples would carry it forward. All right? That's why we have church today. If the longing of God's heart is unity, then guess what? Just like in the Garden of Eden, Satan will not just sit and watch. If God desires Edenic fellowship, Satan will tempt us to eat from the tree of the knowledge and good and evil, life independent from God in his ways. He will attack. He will use sin to bring disunity and division. How would Satan bring disunity and isolate us? How? By the way we view one another. By the way we treat one another. By the way we think about one another. Once again, where will the practice of selflessness and self-giving be when we don't pursue this? Yeah. If I were to sum up the heart of Jesus when he said this prayer, and I'm done here, it says this. In this prayer, the heart of Jesus is this. The communion and intimacy that Jesus had with the Father and the Holy Spirit is the same communion and intimacy he desires for us to walk in. And we will never experience the fullness of it until our Savior returns and he fully restores protology. When he returns and restores original design 
we will experience Edenic fellowship again. Heaven will look like us honoring one another like crazy, loving one another, being a living sacrifice and worshiping God in that way for all eternity, and God's kingdom will continue. But we pray until the day he returns, Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done, Father, here on earth as it is in heaven. Christ went to great lengths to make a way for us that we can have this. Let's not take it for granted. And he has given us, just as the Holy Spirit was given to Jesus to do ministry, he has given us the Holy Spirit to empower us to pursue this as well. Man, what does this say about you and I? And for those who feel a sense of loneliness, those who feel just this desire to belong and be seen, I want to tell you this. This narrative, what does this say about you? It says that you're worth pursuing. It says that you are wanted. You are invited into the highest level of intimacy. You're made for it. It's your portion. It says that we are worthy. We are worthy to join in on this. It's like, it's like I imagine it to be like adoption. I know someone in the States that they live in the States and they adopted two children from kids here in Korea, actually. In the process of adoption, it's, it's no joke. So much paperwork, so much emotional energy invested. It's a long process. And guess what? It's sad to say, but so expensive. Man, this, this married couple I know, they, they set their hearts traveling all the way here to Korea, putting in the time, putting in the energy, paying the money and all that, because they want their children now to feel that they are desired, they are wanted, they are worth pursuing and flying over for, they are worth paying whatever costs, that they may know that they are worthy of being invited into their family's communion. This, this analogy pales infinitely compared to Christ coming from the glories of heaven, making sure that he wants you and I to know he'll pay whatever cost. He'll die upon the cross to make sure you and I know, hey, I want you to be part of this divine communion. That's what he's after, guys. As we continue, as we continue 2022, before we pursue our spiritual disciplines and wanting to connect with God, I want to encourage you to not just listen to this message. Take some time this week to dwell in that simple truth that I'm wanted, that I'm made for intimacy. And it, it's gonna, I hope, I pray, it's gonna make us want to pursue. As Christ was towards me, I wanna be that towards even my own brothers and sisters, towards the world. I wanna make sure if people feel that they are seen, they are wanted, they are desired. I know. This is all very ideal in one sense, right? It's, we still have to deal with our hurts <laughs> and our pain, you know? We still have to heal. But the end goal pursuit, I pray, brothers and sisters, is that we would pursue this to glorify the Father. That's what I pray, all right? Uh, can I have the praise team come up? We're just gonna close with that last song of worship. And... Um, as they close the song for us, I will close with just a practical challenge. Practical challenge. If you're new to our church, we have a vision statement. The vision of our church is 
Calling all to the feast. Calling all to the feast. And what this means is, if I were to connect it to this sermon, it means an invitation for you and I, first and foremost, to commune with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When you pray, pray, converse with the Father as Jesus converses with the Father. Thank the Son for making a way and ask the Holy Spirit for guidance and empowerment. I would like us to grow in enriching our prayer life by praying to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as we commune with Him. And second, and this is a challenge that I want to extend this challenge to you guys. I've been challenged with this. I've been experiencing the beauty of God recently and experiencing God's heart and intimacy with Him recently with people. I've been gathering with brothers to pray, share life, hurt with those who are hurting, rejoice with those who are rejoicing, experiencing and pursuing communion, divine communion. I've been meeting with people that I don't know that well, hearing their stories, offering to pray together, experience just a little bit more of that divine communion. And my heart is, Lord, this year, as the Lord gave me the word communion, I want to experience the same communion that always existed. And I want that to manifest in my life and in this community. So I challenge you, I challenge you, make an invitation, make an invitation. Invite someone over your house. Pursue communion. Share each other's stories. Pray for one another. It's as simple as praying together and encouraging one another in the Lord. I challenge you to do that. So right now, I'd like us to close our eyes. And give you a moment. You don't have to be loud, but speak to the Lord and simply pray, God, I pray that I would experience divine communion in my life. I pray that I would experience divine communion in my life. And God, would you highlight to me, who should I reach out to just as you have reached out to me? Who shall I connect with, Lord, to pursue divine communion? And if you're in here and you feel resistance because there's pain, because you're not yet ready to be vulnerable with another life, I assure you, no pressure. I invite you to pray, Lord, heal me of this. Heal me of this so I can walk in my portion that you have for me. I'm going to give you a moment to pray right now and listen for the Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord. Help us, Holy Spirit. Make our hearts tender and sensitive to this majestic, this glorious inheritance you've given us. What is man that you are mindful of him? Who am I that you invite me into this divine fellowship? Oh Lord, help me to treasure it once again. Help me to desire it once again. Help me to experience once again, together with my brothers and sisters. He hears you, he hears your prayer. Just ask him in faith, ask him in faith.
we can rise to our feet. Before we close this with the closing song, I feel led to invite us into a corporate prayer. Can we pray for this family? Can we pray together in one voice with this community that God would manifest himself here, that we would see the face of God here in this community? Let's just ask the Holy Spirit right now. Lord, help us to be that safe, that authentic, that pure community that reflects your glory in who you are, Lord. Would you manifest that here in this community? Let's pray together, church.